Hey everyone, it's good to be back on this series. This video is possibly the one most people were expecting, and with good reason. From my experience, American evangelicalism is often associated with several different lines of thinking, but I find that conservative, in quotes, American evangelicalism is primarily associated with Zionism and pop dispensationalism. Leaving Christian Zionism and dispensational theology was step one in my conversion into Lutheranism. Most evangelicals with rapture theology think that it's a common belief found among all Christians. I don't have the book on hand, but I recall that when I was at a relative's house, she had a book that distinctly said, quote, all Christians believe in the rapture, end quote. And I think this was a genuine statement. In a lot of cases, these Christians don't think that denying the rapture is something common in traditional circles, but that it's only something you find in liberalism. With that in mind, this topic is pretty important because it's so pernicious as to cause such a mentality that the rapture is the default conservative view. And usually people don't actually understand the theology behind this set of beliefs. With that in mind, let's jump right in. For our purposes, I will critique the dispensational theology commonly referred to as, quote, classical dispensationalism, end quote, as opposed to progressive dispensationalism or ultra-dispensationalism. Progressive dispensationalism and ultra-dispensationalism aren't as common in evangelicalism, at least from my experience. With that in mind, I'll primarily be drawing from Charles Ryrie's classic, Dispensationalism Today, which is seen as the standard for dispensational thought. This book was recommended to me by a very intelligent classical dispensationalist, and most critiques of dispensationalism I've come across have been responses to this book. I will also be heavily drawing from a severely underrated book called Reflections of a Recovering Dispensationalist by a man named S.P. Sammons. I venture to guess that almost nobody in my audience has heard of this book because it was written by a pastor in my area. I actually picked it up at a used bookstore for something like $3, and it was quite worth it. If you can find it, please buy it. I'll also use critiques from John Gerstner's Wrongly Dividing the Word of Truth, a paper by Wolf Mueller on the subject, as well as his book, Has American Christianity Failed? There will be some other resources as well that I will link below, but those are my primary sources. Dispensationalism is a broad movement with a few characteristics, but according to Ryrie, there are three key characteristics of dispensationalism. Quote, one, a dispensationalist keeps Israel and the church distinct. This is probably the most basic theological test of whether or not a person is a dispensationalist, and it is undoubtedly the most practical and conclusive. The one who fails to distinguish Israel and the church consistently will inevitably not hold to dispensational distinctions, and one who does will. 2. A literal interpretation consistently literal or plain interpretation indicates a dispensational approach to the interpretation of scripture. This does not preclude or exclude correct understanding of types, illustrations, apocalypses, and other genres within the basic framework of literal interpretation. Finally, number three, God's underlying purpose in the world is to show his glory. To the normative dispensationalist, the soteriological or saving purpose of God is not the only program, but one of the means God is using in the total program of glorifying himself. Scripture is not man-centered as though salvation were the main theme, but it is God-centered because his glory is the center. End quote. So to summarize, dispensationalism says that the church and Israel are necessarily distinct, we need to interpret the Bible as literally as possible, and the Bible is primarily about the glory of God as opposed to the salvation of man. These are surprisingly basic as the defining characteristics of dispensationalism, but dispensationalists argue that these properties of their system entail certain beliefs. Such beliefs include the division of history into a series of dispensations, the belief in the rapture of the church before the seven-year Great Tribulation, and the literal 1,000-year reign of Christ in Jerusalem, fulfilling the promises given to David in the Davidic Covenant. Dispensational theology says that there is a set of dispensations that can be seen as the meta-narrative of history. Schofield, the author of the popular Schofield Reference Bible, writes that a dispensation is, quote, a period of time during which man is tested in respect of obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God, end quote. Ryrie adds that dispensations are not absolutely synonymous with ages, but they are very closely related. 
Ryrie brings forth his own definition, one that we'll be assuming for the rest of this video. Quote, a dispensation is a distinguishable economy in the outworking of God's purpose, end quote. In each dispensation, there's a distinct revelation, responsibility, testing, failure, and judgment. The distinguishing features are introduced not by man, but by God, all to show his glory in a variety of ways throughout history. Ryrie summarizes as follows, quote, Dispensationalism views the world as a household run by God. In his household world, God is dispensing or administering its affairs according to his own will and in various stages of revelation in the passage of time. These various stages mark off the distinguishably different economies in the outworking of his total purpose, and these different economies constitute the dispensations. End quote. Dispensationalists typically state that there are seven dispensations, but some dispensationalists say that there are as few as four or as many as eight. Ryrie writes that the primary characteristics of each dispensation are as follows. First, a differing relationship between God and the world insofar as God manages the world's economy. Second, the resulting responsibility on mankind in each of these differing relationships. For example, God had a direct relationship with Adam and Eve during the dispensation of innocence, which specifically involved taking care of the garden. Dispensations also include a test, a failure, and a judgment. Ryrie says that in one sense, the test is the same across all dispensations. How will a person respond toward the responsibility of the economy in which he's living? Each test is specific to the corresponding dispensation, but each test is similar insofar as it concerns man's response to his responsibility. Let's examine each dispensation one by one. The first dispensation is called Innocence, and it took place from Genesis 1-3 to 3-6. Adam and Eve had the responsibilities of keeping the garden, filling and subduing the earth, having fellowship with God, and not eating from the tree of knowledge. Adam and Eve sinned, so the judgment was various curses, physical death, and spiritual death. Some will say that a better term for this dispensation would actually be freedom, as humanity wasn't under the bondage of sin at this point. The second dispensation is called Conscience, and it took place from Genesis 4.1 to Genesis 8.14. Man had the following responsibilities in this time. Respond to God through the promptings of the conscience, and bring an acceptable sacrifice to God. Abel, Enoch, and Noah are the primary figures in this dispensation. Man failed to do good, so God brought the flood on the world. The third dispensation is called Civil Government, and it took place from Genesis 8.15 to 11.9. Noah was arguably the most important figure here, and he was also a strong contributor to the failure. Ryrie claims that Noah's drunkenness made him incapable of ruling, so he failed the test. Eventually, the people decided to disobey God's command to properly govern and decided to build the Tower of Babel. God judged the people by confusing the languages of the people. The fourth dispensation is called Promise, or Patriarchal Rule, and it took place from Genesis 11.10 to Exodus 18.27. In this dispensation, the Jews were called to stay in the promised land and believe and obey God. Jacob, however, took his family to Egypt, so God gave them over to Egyptian slavery. The fifth dispensation is called Mosaic Law, and it's a very long dispensation, covering the time from Exodus 19.1 to Acts 1.26. This covers the time from Moses until the death and resurrection of Christ, ending right before Pentecost. In this dispensation, the Israelites were to keep the law and walk with God, but they failed to do so frequently. God gave the Israelites into various captivities as judgments. According to Ryrie and most dispensationalists, we are currently in the sixth dispensation, the dispensation of grace, and this dispensation lasts from Acts 2 to Revelation 19.21. This dispensation is really the age of the church where man has the responsibility to accept the gift of righteousness that God freely offers. This grace is entirely free and is given to all, so God is no longer working with Israel, but with all nations once again. Ryrie writes, quote, The vast majority have rejected him and as a result will be judged. The dispensation will end at the second coming of Christ, since, as suggested, the tribulation period itself is not a dispensation, but is the judgment on those living persons who are Christ rejectors at the end of this present dispensation, end quote. The final dispensation will be the millennium which takes place after the second coming of Christ. The millennium is where all of the promises given in both the Old Testament and New Testament will be fulfilled, particularly the promises given in the Abrahamic and Davidic covenant. Specifically, Christ will run the earth during that age and will be the chief figure. This age will last for 1,000 years and man will be responsible for obedience to Christ and his laws. 
Satan will be bound, Christ will be in power, and righteousness will prevail while overt disobedience will be punished. At the end of this dispensation, there will be a rather formidable army that will attack the seat of government, but this army will be unsuccessful, and all of those members of the army will be sent into everlasting punishment. Notice that in dispensationalism, the majority of time is spent on Israel, God's chosen nation. The age of the church is seen as a parenthetical era or interlude in God's plan. In dispensational theology, Jesus came to the earth to offer the kingdom that we'd find in the millennium, but the Jews rejected him, which led to his crucifixion and the creation of the church. In effect, the millennial age could have come into existence and the church would not exist, but because the Jews rejected Christ, the church was created as a kind of plan B for God. To be fair to dispensationalists, this isn't to say that God didn't anticipate this occurring, but it's like the fall and that God allowed it despite preferring something else. The church will be raptured prior to the Great Tribulation, which is not its own dispensation, actually. And then God will begin re his return to working primarily with Israel as a nation. The millennium itself is interesting as well, because according to dispensationalists, a lot of the promises given to Abraham and David were not fulfilled by Christ, so they've yet to be fulfilled. Dispensational theology says that God will bring back the Mosaic laws into effect, where there will be a third temple in Jerusalem, and ritual sacrifices once more. This isn't to say, at least according to Ryrie, that there are multiple means of salvation, such that the Jews are saved by ceremonial works while Christians are saved by grace, but that there are some distinct promises that God has given Israel regarding the land of Israel and the sacrificial system that need to be fulfilled. In general, dispensationalists say that a lot of the Old Testament was pointing to the millennial kingdom as opposed to Christ and the church. Now that we've given an explanation of dispensational theology, let's examine the system. I want to reiterate that much of what I'll be saying going forward will be summaries of what we find in other writers, so please don't let me take credit for these opinions as I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Let's first examine the historicity of dispensationalism. Anybody who is engaged with dispensationalism is aware that dispensationalism is a relatively new theological system, really being developed by John Nelson Darby in the 19th century. That said, it's not fair to say that there are no elements of dispensationalism in previous thinkers or prior generations. Ryrie correctly notes that Papias, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and many early church fathers were premillennialists, so they believed in a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ. Of course, these figures were surely not dispensationalists, as they were not Zionists and they didn't accept many other tenets of dispensational theology. However, Ryrie correctly responds by saying that we should be concerned with the text first and foremost. Nicholas Hunius, a 16th and 17th century Lutheran scholastic, writes that when someone asks a question like, where was your faith before Luther? The Lutheran could give patristic citations, but he could also say that the words were preserved in scripture and in true believers. Recall that Elijah in 1 Kings 19 believed that he was the only member of Israel, and that Christ tells the disciples to listen to the Pharisees as they sat in Moses' seat and preached from the law. So I don't think this critique is valid. Ryrie and other dispensationalists admittedly over-exaggerate the prevalence of proto-dispensationalism when they cite some early church fathers and post-Reformation figures. But I think we have to be careful when using any critique that comes down to the historicity of a belief apart from scripture. If dispensationalists were to say that all Christians who denied the rapture were going to hell, that'd be another story. But since I don't know any dispensationalists who say that, I won't really discuss that critique any further. Recall that one of the key tenets and distinctives of dispensationalism is a very literal interpretation of the text. I think dispensationalists rightly understand that we cannot arbitrarily decide when things are literal and when they aren't, so I will give them credit there. Martin Chemnitz gives similar arguments in his defense of the real presence of the Eucharist, saying that when we have no reason to take a passage of scripture in any other way than literally, we must stick to the literal interpretation. He spends a lot of time responding to the Reformed by saying that the Eucharistic texts are to be read in their plain and simple meaning, and dispensationalists are bringing forth a similar response to theologians with other eschatological views. That said, I think the dispensational emphasis on literal interpretation goes too far, and they also aren't very consistent. Many dispensationalists I know will say that their interpretations are the most literal that we can find, yet they'll also say that the locusts of Revelation 9 are actually helicopters.
I'd also argue that they surely don't take the words of the apostles literally either. If dispensationalists were consistent throughout the entirety of the text, they'd affirm the real presence in baptismal regeneration, but they don't. I'd also like to ask dispensationalists if the nations in the future will actually use bows, arrows, shields, and battle, as Ezekiel 39 says. O.T. Alice points out that dispensationalists will say that Israel must mean Israel and Canaan must mean Canaan, but Eve, Rebecca, Zephyrah are spiritual types and so on. I've even heard some popular level dispensationalists say that the eagles in Revelation are symbols of the United States. Frankly, holding a consistently literal interpretation throughout the entirety of the Bible is not possible, and it's also not warranted. Stephen Sammons points out that there are times when scripture is not interpreted literally in the New Testament. Dispensationalists like to accuse other systems of reading the Old Testament in light of the New Testament as though that's a twisting of the text, but unfortunately for dispensationalists, scripture itself engages in this practice. For example, Hosea 11.1 1 says, quote, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son, end quote. Matthew 2, 13 through 18 says that Hosea's prophecy was fulfilled in Christ. On the dispensational hermeneutic, Matthew shouldn't have done this, but lo and behold, it's here. The Old Testament also interprets itself in non-literal ways too. In Genesis 17, 7 through 8, Canaan is given to Abraham as an everlasting possession for him and his descendants. But in Isaiah 65 and 66, the everlasting kingdom is actually the entirety of the new heavens and new earth. Paul says in Romans 4.13 that Abraham is the heir of the whole world, not just the land of Canaan. Again, the dispensational approach to literalism should not allow this. A friend of mine, a former dispensationalist himself, likes to say that the entirety of the book of Hebrews is a polemic against dispensationalism, and we'll get to that some more later. For now, let's notice that Hebrews frequently allegorizes the text too. Hebrews 12, 18 through 24 says that in Christ, heavenly Jerusalem is present. There are many other examples of this, like John the Baptist preceding Christ in the power and spirit of Elijah, while Malachi 4 says that it would actually be Elijah. To avoid many of these conclusions, dispensationalists will simply throw the prophecies to refer to the millennium instead of Christ. For example, they say that Malachi 4 has not actually been fulfilled, but that Elijah will return in the flesh before Christ's second coming during the Great Tribulation. Ryrie himself says that the Sermon on the Mount is not meant for Christians in the Church Age. You heard that right. Charles Ryrie says that the Sermon on the Mount is not binding on the Church, but it gives the Church valuable principles. Some dispensationalists say that Christ was actually giving ceremonial law. So in the millennium, if a Jew's eye causes him to lust, he must pluck it out, and so on. This in itself should be enough to show that the dispensational hermeneutic is nonsensical, but we have much more to say. If this passage were primarily about the millennium, then Christ's statements about suffering in the surrounding context make no sense. In Matthew 5, 11 through 12, Jesus says that there will be some who revile his audience and persecute them. But how is there persecution when Jesus is the ruler of the world and evil is kept underground? The scriptures speak of Christ ruling with righteousness and justice in his reign, but Matthew 5 through 7 certainly is written for an era when there's persecution and injustice. Returning to the dispensational approach to Christ's fulfillment of prophecies, I must repeat that the dispensationalists remove many prophecies pointing to Christ in the church and instead say that these are fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. This makes total sense, as the dispensational hermeneutic is explicitly not Christocentric, but theocentric, according to Ryrie. I'd argue that dispensationalism is ultimately Israeli-centric, a term Brian Wolfmuller likes to employ. Recall that for dispensationalists, the goal of history is the millennium. In Lutheranism, the climax of history is truly the incarnation, when the second person of the triune God assumes a human nature and lives out a human life, sacrificing himself to the Father to appease his wrath and resurrects in glory. Dispensationalists say that the goal of history is the earthly millennium, when Jesus will return and rule with an iron rod from the throne of David in Jerusalem. Frankly, this is an insult to the gospel. Wolfmuller quotes in Gelder, who says that for dispensationalists, justification is by grace for Christ's sake through faith, but that's relegated to the status of a mere parenthesis by the saving works of God. After this age is over, we'll go back to the glorious dispensation of the law. In the Millennial Kingdom, the final and most glorious dispensation, the legal system, the law of merit, comes back. Wolfmuller provides a brilliant insight. He says that dispensationalism is ultimately a theology of glory, one that is ashamed of the cross. Dispensationalists promise to win the world for Christ in the Millennium with something better than the Gospel. 
something better than the merits of Christ crucified. The Old Testament and New Testament does not follow their understanding of history, as it describes many prophecies not to this millennial kingdom, but to Christ himself. The dispensationalists believe that Christ came to establish the millennial kingdom, but Christ doesn't act this way in the Gospels. He says that his kingdom is not of this world in John 18.36, and he says in Luke 17.20-21 that the kingdom of God isn't something that can be observed, but is instead in our midst. As Tertullian writes, quote, This means neither in this palace nor in this place that is kingdom of God, for behold, it is within you, end quote. Dispensationalists escape this by positing that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are two distinct entities. According to dispensationalists, the kingdom of heaven is God's rule on earth during the millennium, fulfilling all the promises to national Israel throughout the Old Testament. This means that the parable of the sower and the parable of the mustard seed don't apply today, which is surely absurd. Most importantly, notice that Jesus runs away from the Jews when they try to make him king in John 6.15. But the dispensationalists say that's exactly what didn't happen. According to dispensationalists, God wanted the Jews to make Jesus their king, but Jesus ran away when that happened. St. Augustine brilliantly interprets John 6.15 as follows, quote, Yet he who feared to be made king was a king, not made king by men, for he ever reigns with the Father in that he is the Son of God, but making men kings. Which kingdom of his the prophets had foretold? Christ, by being made man, made the believers in him Christians, members of his kingdom, incorporated and purchased by his word. And this kingdom will be made manifest after the judgment, when the brightness of his saints shall be revealed. The disciples, however, and the multitude who believed in him thought that he had come to reign now, and so would have taken him by force to make him king, wishing to anticipate his time, which he kept secret." End quote. Some dispensationalists have responded that Jesus didn't want to become king based on a revolutionary spirit, but how else would he have become king? Is not the millennial kingdom inaugurated after great destruction in the dispensationalist system anyway? Most importantly, the scriptures never speak of Jesus' crucifixion as plan B. Nowhere does the Bible say that Jesus went up to be crucified because the Jews failed their test. Let's contemplate this for a moment as well. What would have happened if Jesus were made king by the Jews? Would the Gentiles be saved? Would sins be covered by Christ? All atonement theories that say that Christ's death was necessary have to be thrown out the window, because according to dispensationalists, the death of Christ was just kind of a happy accident permitted by God. The prophets speak over and over again about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, proclaiming that action to be the salvation of the world. Did John the Baptist proclaim Christ as king of the Jews there to rescue them from the Romans, or did he proclaim Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Consistent dispensationalists insult the gospel by pointing the text away from Christ, saying that what he did was not the fulfillment of the Old Testament. For example, in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, it's said that God will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah. At the Last Supper, Christ says, quote, This is my blood of the new covenant. End quote. Do Gentiles receive the new covenant in the blood or not? Surely anybody who partakes of the Eucharist is receiving the blood of the new covenant. But dispensationalists have to say that Jesus did not institute the new covenant because this was not given to the house of Israel and Judah, but to the disciples and thus the churches. Ultra-dispensationalists are actually consistent as they'll say that we should not partake of the Eucharist, for only Jews can do so in the millennium. Further, Hebrews 8 speaks of Christ as the mediator of the, quote, better covenant, end quote, that Jeremiah promised. Will the dispensationalists say that we don't have a mediator in Christ? I've seen some ultra-dispensationalists act consistently and say that because of this, Hebrews is not true until the millennium, that Hebrews doesn't apply to the church. Within this hermeneutic, Christians are not allowed to partake in communion, which means that one of the most historic and ancient rites of the church has been completely in error. Paul himself would be in error when writing to the Corinthians regarding the Eucharist, unless the Corinthians were only Jewish. Instead, Let's return to the true words of scripture, interpreting the text in a Christocentric way. As Wolfmuir says, quote, The veil over the New Testament is taken off only in Christ, end quote. And he cites 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 16. This leads us to our next point. The divide between Israel and the church is not as strong as dispensationalists say. In fact, the church is Israel today. We contend that the church is Israel and that the Old Testament Israel was the church. There's a straw man in dispensationalism that non-dispensationalists believe that Israel was replaced by the church, and one that I think has some merit based on some of the discussions I've seen from certain popular figures. However, we don't affirm that. We believe that the Old Testament saints were members of the church, and so are we. 
We can read Hebrews 11 and say that we are in the same body as those who lived prior to Christ. Dispensationalists can't really say that. Dispensationalists say that the body does not use the term Israel for the church. Therefore, Israel and the church are separate entities. That's not true, however. As Paul says, quote, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, end quote, Ephesians 4, 6. He further says that there is, quote, neither Jew nor Greek, end quote, Galatians 3, 28, showing that the redemptive superiority of the Jews was abolished in the atonement of Christ. In effect, God has made the Jews and Gentiles one in Christ. We also know that the Septuagint frequently uses the word ekklesia to refer to Israel in the Old Testament, and the same phrase is used for the church in the New Testament. The church is also the fulfillment of some prophecies found in the Old Testament. Dispensationalists say that many of God's promises to the Jews regarding Israel as a land have not been fulfilled, but the scriptures tell us that the church is the heavenly fulfillment of such promises. In Hebrews 12, 22, the quote, heavenly Jerusalem, end quote, is the redeemed saints. John saw a quote, new Jerusalem, end quote, coming down prepared as a bride for her husband in Revelation 21. Paul speaks of the church as the bride of Christ in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. With that in mind, the bride of Christ and the new Jerusalem are one and the same entity, as Christ does not have multiple brides. Therefore, the church is Israel in Pauline and Johannine theology. Just think about it. If we're not to confuse the church in Israel, it's awfully misleading that the new Jerusalem is being prepared as a bride for Christ. What kind of sense does that make if they're supposed to be so distinct? The dispensationalist system seeks to divide the church and Israel into two distinct peoples, where the church is an inferior or an afterthought. However, as Kim Riddlebarger notes, Christ tells Peter in Matthew 16 that the church would not fall to the gates of Hades, and the church has the keys such that whatever is bound on earth is bound in heaven, and whatever is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. What kind of inferior people is this? God's purpose from the beginning was clearly to create a church that resists Satan's attacks until the return of Christ. Some dispensationalists argue that 1 Corinthians 10.32, which says, quote, do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the Church of God, end quote, entails that Jews in the Church are distinct. If that's their reading of the verse, they also have to show that Greeks, who are clearly stand-ins for the Gentiles, are not the Church either. So nobody's really the Church. The Church is an empty entity, an unbound variable of sorts. Instead, the natural meaning of the text is that these Jews are non-believing Jews, the Greeks are non-believing Gentiles, and the church is the combination of believing Jews and Gentiles. It's also important to define an Israelite. Dispensationalists are really inconsistent on this, and they have to be if they want to read the Old Testament correctly. They'll say that Israel is national Israel, the physical descendants of Abraham. However, Elijah in 1 Kings 19 says that he was, quote, the last one left, end quote, as Israel had abandoned God's covenant. Would the Jews at his time, the physical descendants of Abraham, receive the millennial kingdom if Christ came then? In John 8, 42-44, Jesus tells the Pharisees that they're of the devil, their father. So Christ doesn't care that they're of Abraham, but rebuts that they're of Satan. This is where it's always tricky with dispensationalists. Clearly, the dispensationalists can't affirm that the Pharisees would receive the promises of the Old Testament Israel, else they say that Christ was wrong in this condemnation. But if only the believing Jews, and thus not the genetic Jews, receive the promises of the Old Testament, then what do they need to believe in? Can they actively deny Christ and still be approved by the Father and the Son? Matthew 10.33 says quite the opposite. In Joshua 24.27, if one denies God, they lose their status in the covenant. The covenant of God is clearly conditional on man's end, as Deuteronomy 11.26-28, Deuteronomy 28.15, and Leviticus 26.14-33 show. Denying Christ is denying God, therefore. Romans 4 tells us that Abraham and his offspring received the promises not from the law, but from faith. Therefore, if someone denies Christ, they don't receive the righteousness because they don't have saving faith. Dispensationalists are telling the physical descendants of Abraham that they can put confidence in their flesh, which Paul condemns all over Romans 2 and in Philippians 3.3. Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 16.22 that if anybody doesn't love Jesus Christ, he's anathema. Silly Paul. He forgot to mention that the Jews actually have a covenant with God so that they're okay despite simply denying Christ. Ambrosiaster comments, quote, Paul is referring to the Jews, who were accursed because they said that the Lord had not yet come, end quote. He also says, quote, For neither the privileges of their ancestors nor the law can do the Jews any good if they do not accept the merit and promise made to them, end quote, commenting on Romans 10.12.
Again, the true Israel is the church. Galatians 3.29 says that those who belong to Christ are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Dispensationalists sometimes posit that there are different promises for the different people, but this is clearly an ad hoc reading of the text based upon their interpretive grid. We also have to ask what to do with the saints before Israel. What do we do with Abel, with Seth, Enoch, or Noah? A favorite passage of dispensationalists is Romans 11, where it's said in verse 26 that all Israel will be saved. There's a debate regarding the term Israel here. It appears in Romans 9 that not all Israel is Israel, but I want to be fair and acknowledge that this passage is somewhat obscure. St. Ambrose and other church fathers actually do take this passage to mean literal Israel in some sense, so I want to be fair and note that this interpretation isn't without precedent. However, this passage is quite damning to the dispensational system. Romans 11 only talks about one tree as God's people. To quote Salmon's, in Romans 11.17, Paul talks about branches being broken off and branches being grafted in. However, they are broken off and grafted into the same tree. There are not two trees. Notice that the wild branches, a reference to the Gentile church, are grafted into the tree from which some of the natural branches, a reference to Israel, are broken off." End quote. The dispensationalist system would have to say that there are two trees, but that's not what the text says. The text says that there is one people of God, though some branches are grafted in. Now that we've discussed the dispensational divorce of the church in Israel, Let's look at the dispensations themselves. This point is minor relative to what we've already discussed, but I think, with Salmon's, that some of the dispensations are pretty arbitrary. For example, the new revelation given after the flood was that the people could eat meat and capital punishment was mandated for murder. Admittedly, God promises that he'd never flood the earth again as in Noah's day, but that's not a human oversight of the economy, that's an action of God. Therefore, it's odd to say that permitting someone to eat meat and mandating capital punishment entails a new dispensation. If we want to be consistent, the destruction of Jerusalem and the glory of God leaving the temple should be a new dispensation. There are a lot of events in the scriptures that should qualify as new dispensations. Going from judges to kings would make sense, as there is a new government which came in as rejection of the governance of the judges. There were prophets sent and specific revelations given to the kings on how they were to take care of Israel. What about the exile of Babylon? How about the post-exilic prophets? We could go on for a while, but this just shows that the dispensations are somewhat arbitrary. While each dispensation is interesting, let's focus on the millennium. Recall that for dispensationalists, the goal of history is to reach the millennium, where Jesus will reign physically on earth in Jerusalem and the Old Testament sacrifices will return. Think about how odd this is, if not really blasphemous. Dispensationalists say that God intends to bring back the Old Covenant sacrifices. Was Christ's sacrifice not enough? Did his suffering not include salvation for the Jews? It's also blatant ignorance of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 8, 7-13 says the following, quote, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away." End quote. This entire passage is about how the New Covenant is the perfect fulfillment of the Old Covenant, and the Old Covenant is obsolete such that it's growing old and vanishing. In the dispensational system, this is entirely false. The Old Covenant returns in the millennium, which is the goal of history. So the Old Covenant is part of the climax of history. What's the point of the New Covenant? How is the Old Covenant obsolete whatsoever? Dispensationalism is seriously a confusion of types and antitypes, pointing the Christian away from Christ and towards Israel. Dispensationalists also say that the millennium is centered around the physical land of Israel, as that's what the Jews of the Old Testament were promised. Tell that to the author of Hebrews. I'm serious here. Just read the book of Hebrews and tell me if dispensationalism is plausible at all. Hebrews 11 says that the epistle's audience has come to Mount Zion and to the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Is this to say that all the audience traveled to Mount Zion, which is the true heavenly Jerusalem, 
for verses 13 through 16 could not be clearer. It says that the Old Testament saints died not having received the promises, but they could have returned to their earthly abode. Verse 16 says, quote, But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. End quote. It is entirely ad hoc to say that this is speaking of the millennial kingdom in physical Israel. The whole point is that physical Israel isn't what they sought. They sought the heavenly kingdom, a true homeland, not their physical land. But no, the dispensationalist has to say that the Old Testament saints want property. At the end of the chapter, in verses 39 and 40, it said, quote, And all these, having obtained a good testimony in faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us, end quote. There's a lot to unpack here. First, they didn't receive the promise, though they had the land at the time. Second, God provides something better than though they had. And third, they are made perfect with us. Who is, quote, us here? If it's only the Jews in Israel during the millennium, then Hebrews isn't applicable to Christians, so we don't have Christ as our mediator. The Christian can't cling to the promises and comforts of this epistle. But if the us includes the church, then the Old Testament saints of Hebrews 11 are made perfect with the Christians, and they aren't apart from us. But in dispensationalism, the Jews and Christians have different destinies and different goals. I must reiterate that the dispensational system disparages the gospel. Justification by faith is just an interlude, a kind of placeholder. Afterwards, we'll return to the law, to animal sacrifices, and the death of Christ won't really matter anymore. We should also discuss the most popular aspects of dispensationalism today. Most implicit dispensationalists that I know would hear what I said above and be shocked and rightly respond negatively. However, they still uphold rapture theology, which is a key aspect of dispensationalism. Rapture theology basically says that prior to the seven-year Great Tribulation, the church is taken up to heaven in the blink of an eye. To be fair, there are some that say the church is raptured in the middle of seven years or after seven years, but for the most part, the dispensationalists will say that the rapture is pre-tribulational. This concept may seem really weird relative to everything else here. What does the rapture have to do with seven dispensations anyway? Quite a lot, actually. To quote Sammons, the rapture of the church allows God to go back to using Israel at the forefront of his plan and fulfill Daniel's 70th week. End quote. The rapture is the means by which God goes back to the old covenant, as he takes the new covenant people off the earth. I honestly don't see the need of removing the church to go back to the old covenant, but that's not important relative to the other issues mentioned. As mentioned at length before, this system is built on the idea that the new covenant and the church are just interludes, and the old covenant is perfect in itself. Read Hebrews to see the truth. There are a few primary passages used to defend the idea of a pre-tribulational rapture. The main passage is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18, and others are pretty much supplemental. This is the passage that contains the word rapture, at least in Latin. Verse 17 talks about the church being caught up to meet God, so dispensationalists say that this is the church going up to God before the tribulation. This is definitely a stretch, and the context indicates such. Let's read the full passage. Quote, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. End quote. This text isn't written to give a detailed eschatology, but to give comfort to the Christians of Thessalonica who thought that they wouldn't be able to see those who died in Christ ever again. Further, the word for coming is parousia, which is used frequently for Christ's future coming. The use of this word in the rest of the New Testament shows that this coming isn't just a brief moment, but a long presence. For example, this word is used several times to discuss when others came to visit Paul. See 1 Corinthians 16, verse 17, and 2 Corinthians 7, verses 6 through 7. The dispensationalist has to say that the word parousia is actually a reference to a kind of snatch-and-go, as opposed to a long-lasting stay, which is what we find everywhere else in the New Testament. Many scholars have pointed out that in secular literature, the word parousia was frequently used in this era to refer to a king visiting his city full of pomp and splendor. 
That's exactly the opposite of what rapture theology teaches. Read the passage again. Notice that there's a loud command on a trumpet call of God. The dispensationalist says that God will be really loud, but this rapture is actually secret and will leave the world wondering what happened to all the Christians. That's definitely weird. Dispensationalists also use part of the next chapter, 1 Thessalonians 5, to support rapture theology. They say that the thief in the night of verse 2 is a reference to Christ coming when we least expect him. Of course, for someone who is mid-tribulational or post-tribulational, they can actually just calculate the days. Another favorite passage to defend the rapture is Matthew 24, 36-42, where it said that two men will be in a field, then one will be taken away. Two women will be grinding at the mill, then one will be taken away. The dispensationalist will say that this whole discussion of one being taken away is a reference to the rapture, but that's not what Jesus is saying. This passage especially tells us to look at the times of Noah for an example, but in Noah's day the flood came and took away the unbelievers. Instead of this passage being about a secret rapture, this is the final judgment where the unbelievers are taken away to be judged. Being taken away is not a good thing. We want to be left behind. So as we've seen, the rapture is not biblical, but it's really damaging to the average Christian. I recall when I was young, I wondered what would happen to my dog as the rest of my family was raptured. Who would feed him? Churches that support dispensationalism also tend to focus on eschatology too much, and it makes sense. Recall that for the dispensationalist, the goal of history is to reach the millennium, whereas for the rest of Christianity, the incarnation is truly the climax of history. This focus on eschatology has led many to simply ignore other doctrines that are very important. I can say from personal experience that there are many who can tell you about the timeline of the end times, but ask them a question about predestination, Christology, or soteriology, and they'll be dumbfounded. They'll forget key doctrines of the faith so they can try to figure out who the Antichrist is. Wolf Muir says that American Christianity has a kind of, quote, crisis mentality, wherein there are the prophecy buffs who preach, quote, with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other, end quote. Of course, this isn't to say that Christians are supposed to be ignorant of eschatology. Far from it. This is simply to say that we aren't supposed to forget the rest of God's word, knowing more about Israeli politics than sacramentology. According to dispensational theology, there's a seven-year Great Tribulation in which God will complete his discipline of Israel and judge the unbelieving inhabitants of earth. The Great Tribulation is really the second half of a seven-year span, so it's roughly three and a half years. Dispensationalists say that the Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel after the temple is rebuilt, then he'll break that covenant after three and a half years by stopping sacrifices and grain offerings. According to dispensationalists, Revelation 13.5 tells us that the Antichrist will be in power for exactly 42 months. Christ will then return for the final judgment, execute wrath on the earth for unbelief and rebellion, then he'll bring about the millennium, centered on the nation-state of Israel. During the Great Tribulation, there's a revived Roman Empire that's really a ten-nation federation of nations that come out of the ancient Roman Empire. This is why some dispensationalists are terrified of the EU and the United Nations. Dispensationalists calculate a lot of this from Daniel 9 verses 24 through 27, saying that the 70th week occurs at the end of the church age, where the rapture then occurs. Historically, this passage of scripture has been taken Christologically. There's no absolute unity regarding the understanding of this passage, but generally it follows this structure. The first 69 weeks are roughly between 483 and 490 years, bringing us to the baptism of Christ, the beginning of his ministry. Then, the one week is seven years, which begins at the time of Christ's baptism and ends when the apostles teach in Jerusalem after the resurrection. Christ preached for about three and a half years, then the apostles spent three and a half years preaching in Jerusalem. When it said that God will confirm the covenant with many in one week, we say that the new covenant is then given and sacrifices the law will end as Christ is sacrificed. The abomination of desolation is said to occur even to the end of the age. Notice, again, the distinction between the dispensationalist hermeneutic and this other hermeneutic. The dispensationalist says that the focus is Israel, whereas this other interpretation is inherently Christological. After the Great Tribulation is the millennium, as previously mentioned. Returning to the millennium, Dispensationalists are very serious about the literalism of the 1,000 years. It has to be a 1,000 years, as Revelation 20, 1-10 through 10 tells us, of a 1,000-year time in which Satan will be bound and the saints will be with Christ. Insisting that the 1,000-year time must be exactly 1,000 years is odd, especially considering the rest of Scripture. 
The Bible frequently uses the number 1,000 in a symbolic sense. Let's look at a few examples. Psalm 50.10 says, quote, For every beast of the forest of mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. End quote. Does God not own the cattle on the 1,001st hill? Verse 12 says that the entire world is his, so this number 1,000 should mean fullness. Next, Psalm 105, 7 through 8, quote, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word which he commandeth for a thousand generations. We don't want to say that God forgets his promise once the thousand first generation comes around. Next, Psalm 94, quote, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night, end quote. Does God only have sight that extends to perfectly a thousand years, not a day more, not a day less? Next, 2 Peter 3, 8, quote, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, end quote. It should be clear from the above that the number 1,000 shouldn't be taken so literally. What's important is that this isn't just me being some theological liberal who wants to avoid taking the scriptures seriously. I'm actually taking the scriptures as they're meant to be taken. Wolf Mueller brilliantly summarizes the proper understanding of the 1,000 years. Quote, the scriptures consistently use a thousand, and specifically a thousand years, to indicate the fullness and completeness of something. When we come to the 1,000 years of Revelation, we have the same thing. The 1,000 years indicates the full and complete time of the Lord's ruling and reigning. Using scripture to interpret scripture, we understand the 1,000 years of Revelation not as a chronological demarcation, but as a theological indication of the complete patience of the Lord before his return. End quote. Dispensationalism teaches that the binding of Satan is yet to occur, something that will happen when Christ returns. However, the text speaks as though the binding of Satan has already occurred. Mark 3, 26-27 says as follows, quote, And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house, end quote. In this parable, Satan is the strong man whose house is the world. Christ is the thief while the goods are the unbelieving people of earth. The thief binds the strong man and steals his goods. So too Christ binds Satan to rescue sinners from Satan's kingdom. John confirms this later as well. 1 John 3, 8 says, quote, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. End quote. As Wolf Muir says, If Christ didn't destroy the works of Satan, then Christ failed, or at least didn't fulfill his purpose. The common objection, of course, will be one from experience. Our world is still pretty bad. There's still sin, there's death, there's despair. Of course, this is putting experience over the text, and Hebrews 2, 7-8 through 8, responds to this by citing Psalm 8. Quote, you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. This passage tells us that Christ is in power, but we simply don't see it. We see the horrors of our world but Christ is truly in control. With all of this in mind, the amillennial, the Lutheran for our sake, knows that we are in the millennia. Christ has bound Satan in the incarnation and atonement, and while we don't see the reality of Christ's power on earth, we know it by faith. Dispensationalism has also led to the heavy Zionism of American Christianity. Think about it. If Israel is truly God's people, then we need to support them. I've been told by some dispensationalists that if the United States doesn't give aid to Israel every year, God will forsake his covenant with the United States. Of course, the Bible doesn't know of any covenant between God and the United States, but that's beside the point. I've been told that I'll be cursed if I deny the right of post-1948 Israel to maintain their land. This leads many Christians to spend a ton of time defending Israel instead of studying more important matters. I recall when I was younger, I was dogmatic that the Palestinians were actually more evil than the Israelites, that anybody who wanted to, quote, free Palestine, end quote, hated God. One dispensationalist I knew at the time told me that he knew Rick Warren wasn't a Christian because he didn't support Israel. Rick Warren obviously has a lot of problems, but this is not that important comparatively. So your salvation, at least according to this man, is tied to your opinion on foreign policy. To be fair, this doesn't come from nowhere. In Genesis 12, 3, it's said that anybody who blesses Abraham will be blessed, and anyone who curses him will be cursed. 
As we've shown above, Christians are the true heirs of Abraham, so this has nothing to do with the 1948 ethnostate of Israel. I want to be clear that I'm not condemning anyone for supporting Israel or supporting the plight of the Palestinians. I'm merely saying that the text doesn't force us to defend Israel created in the 20th century for every action they perform. The Christian conscience is no longer forced to defend a people for everything they do solely on the basis of their genetics. I know of some dispensationalists who will actually say that we aren't to provide the gospel to the Jews, for they have their own covenant. That's really sad and ignores what Hebrews tells us, that the old covenant is only a shadow of what we have in Christ. Kim Riddlebarger brought up something really important in his book Defending Amillennialism. How do we understand the final judgment and resurrection with the dispensational hermeneutic? Dispensationalists say that the judgment occurs at the end of the millennial age, fully 1,000 years after the return of Christ. Thus, there's a 1,000-year gap between the return of Christ and the final judgment. The text just doesn't say this. Let's read a few passages of Scripture to understand. Matthew 25, 31-32 says, quote, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. End quote. 2 Thessalonians 1, 5-10 says, Which is manifestly evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. End quote. These passages are clear. Christ comes and immediately executes judgment. The dispensationalist has to say that Jesus comes, has a full thousand years, and then judges. The text gives no warrant for that interpretation. Jesus and Paul just decided not to mention the 1,000 years between the judgment and resurrection, which turns out to be the climax of history. That's quite an important event to forget. Dispensationalists are at a crossroads. Either Christ and Paul just didn't mention the millennium, or there are actually two final judgments. If the former, then Paul and Jesus were really bad at relaying the message of history's goal, the millennium, the goal of all reality. It was just conveniently forgotten by Paul and our Lord. All the language of the final judgment happening immediately at the second advent is just a coincidence, maybe a mistake. The word eta in Greek, which translates to then in English, implies no delay between Christ's coming and the final judgment. But if the latter, where there are two final judgments, then there's a separating of the goats and sheep at the beginning of the millennium, then a second one at the end of it. If that's the case, then how do we understand the existence of evil during the millennium? The dispensational hermeneutic says that Satan is bound in Revelation 20 at the beginning of the millennium. Then Satan is released and again deceives the nations. Who's around to be deceived? If it's the saints of the church, then there's a second fall of humanity into sin after the resurrection and judgment. But if it's unbelievers, then the first judgment was pointless. Nothing happens. I want to finish this video with some of my favorite patristic citations on the matter of Israel and the church. First, from St. Jerome commenting on Matthew 12, 28. Quote, there is also a third kingdom of the Holy Scripture, which shall be taken from the Jews and be given to a nation that brings forth the fruit thereof. End quote. Justin Martyr, in his dialogue with Trifo, chapter 125, says, quote, All who through him have fled for refuge to the Father constitute the blessed Israel. End quote. Justin Martyr, again, in his dialogue with Trifo, chapter 135, quote, As therefore Christ is the Israel and the Jacob, even so we, who have been quarried out from the bowels of Christ, are the true Israelitic race. End quote. Finally, Alquin of York, commenting on Revelation 3 9, says, quote, Now they say that they are the Jews, but are not, because they have lost on the inside spiritually the name they bear on the outside, literally. For the expression of the name of Jews is the confession of Christ. End quote. This was obviously a lot of material, so thank you for sticking through it. I look forward to continuing this series on American evangelicalism, perhaps touching on dispensationalism again in the future. Thanks for watching, everyone.